grateful to have our online audience join us on tonight. And we're thankful for our bishop who is behind the whole wisdom of Wednesday School. And it has been exciting. We are glad for our pastors, Pastor Torre and Pastor Sarah Roberts. This has been an exciting time. Uh, and we're looking forward to what God will do for us tonight as it relates to forgiveness, forgiveness. So I can, um, I can assume, but I don't think I necessarily have to assume, I'm, I think I'm pretty close to right, that if you are sitting in this class this evening, either you have someone that you may need to consider forgiving or you know someone that needs help in forgiving. Most of us, at one point or time in our lives, have had to forgive someone of something. Am I right? Am I right? And forgiveness is not an easy thing. We'll talk more about that as I move forward with this lesson. But I think it is ironic, for lack of a better word, that the thing that our Christian belief system is built on is what is so difficult for us to do. Our, our entire belief system is built on the fact that God sent his son and his son died so that we could be forgiven of our sins and be reconciled back to him. I'm going to talk more about that, but I just thought I would start by just dropping that nugget in and, and giving you a moment to think about how significant that is. The one thing that is most important about our salvation is the thing that we struggle with. It may not be the most, but it is a struggle, forgiveness. So let's get started with healing the power of forgiveness. That uh, actually, the, the, the first word right there is where the power is. It is healing. When we forgive, we can be healed. But we're going to give some basic definitions. We're going to start there. And um, we just want to get that part out of the way. We basically know what forgiveness is. But the dictionary, Merriam-Wester says that forgiveness is the act of forgiving, which means to stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone who has done something wrong. That's one definition, but to go to a more biblical definition, it's very short, it's not lengthy, but it, it's, it's more of a, a religious word, if you will, to pardon or to give, to give up resentment and grant relief to an offender. To grant relief to an offender. So tonight there are a few takeaways and we want you to, um, there, there may be more than the ones that I'm getting ready to, to name for you, but there are a few takeaways and those takeaways, um, consists of knowing why, in other words, knowing why to forgive, knowing how, knowing how to forgive, and knowing when, knowing when to forgive. So those are the main key takeaways from tonight's lesson. So let's look at a few scriptures before we get into uh, the why, the how, and the when. Let's, let's see what God's word says about forgiveness. Um, we seem to forget when, we, when, when we're struggling with forgiveness that scripture has a plenty to say about forgiveness. So you can jot these scriptures down. Um, let's see, the first one is Matthew 6, 14 through 15, where Jesus said, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, this is the NIV version, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, 
your father will not forgive your sins. This is what Jesus said. So in your paper Bible, that's going to be written in red. Jesus said, if you don't forgive other people, the Father will not forgive you. That's how critical this is. Then there's this whole thing about Peter asking Jesus in Matthew 18 and 21, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Jesus answered Peter. Because Peter's question was, should it be, um, if someone sins against me, should I forgive them seven times? And Jesus said, no, not seven times. Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Y'all know y'all's multiplication? How many times is that? 490 times. What did Jesus mean when he said to Peter to forgive 70 times seven? Well, Peter was wishing or hoping to appear especially forgiving and benevolent. So he asked Jesus if forgiveness was to be offered seven times. The Jewish rabbis, listen to this, the Jewish rabbis of that time taught that forgiving someone more than three times was unnecessary. That was the teachings that came from the Jewish rabbis. So due to this Old Testament belief and teaching, Peter may have thought that offering forgiveness with uh, uh, maybe twice as often would get him some extra kudos, some points with Jesus. Um, I'm not going to suggest three times. I'm not going to suggest four times. I'm going to double it plus. Let's, let's go for seven. That should get some attention in, in my direction. But when Jesus responded that forgiveness should be offered 490 times, far beyond what Peter was proposing, it must have stunned Peter and the disciples who were listening. No doubt, they were still thinking in the limited terms of the law rather than in the unlimited terms of grace. They were stuck. So Jesus did not want them counting the number of times that, they, that they, they should or should not forgive. That's not what this was about when he even gave them a number 70 times 7. He was teaching them that it was more important to have a forgiving heart, always ready to extend grace to others. Always ready to extend grace to to others. So the next time you read that text and think about Jesus' response, don't try to count the number of times and, and counting your way up to 490 times because you might have to go to 500. You might have to go to six. You might have to go to 1,000. It's not about the number as much as it is about having the heart and being ready to forgive. We're we going to get the scriptures out the way because I want y'all to have the scriptures. I thought about it myself when I was preparing this, and I thought, well, get the heaviest part out front. It's in the Bible. It's in the Word of God. And, and Jesus is the one. And I, I think it just, it's just fitting that he would be the one to promote forgiveness. Well, let's go to Corinthians 5, 18 and 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 21. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, 
not counting people's sins against them, mm, not counting people's sins against them, thank God, and he was committed to us he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who he had made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what was done for us to be reconciled back to God. So in this context, rec reconciliation really just means a repaired relationship, a repaired relationship. This reveals to us that there was a relational issue between God and man. That issue was sin. Because God is perfectly holy, sin is offensive to him. I think we forget that sometimes. Sin offends God. But he did not stop there. After reconciling the world, he, but he went through the trouble of, 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 of repairing the relationship by, by sending his son and making him the way, causing him to be the way for us to repair that relationship. But he didn't stop there. After reconciling the world back to himself and revealing to us the message of a repaired relationship, we then became ambassadors. We now have the responsibility to speak on behalf of Christ, sharing the gospel and telling others what he did for us and, and, and the provision and the way that has been made for them. In other words, after we have been forgiven and our relationship with God has been reconciled, we are then deputized to spread the word so that others will also be reconciled. That is our responsibility. Why? Because forgiveness is a big deal to God. As simple as that. Forgiveness is a big deal to God. So let's look at another text, Colossians 3.13. The NIV version says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive, listen to this part, as the Lord forgave you. I just want to know, did anybody have anything that needed to be forgiven? Or you just took advantage of the blood just because you didn't have, you didn't really have any sin. You just, it's all the po folks that needed to be forgiven. Let me see your hand. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. We, I, I didn't come here. I know we all had to come as infants, as babies, and look like we were innocent, but we were born in sin. And I thank God for the blood. I thank God for the blood. He forgave us. And so now the scripture is telling us that if we have a grievance with somebody, we need to forgive them just like he forgave us. And that's been the, 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 the theme or the thought in every text that I have presented to you on tonight thus far. C.S. Lewis says, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Some of us would rather not have anyone know what we had to be forgiven for. 
I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on that one. We, we got some stuff that God forgave, but we want to leave it under the blood. There's no point in talking about it. There's no point in bringing it up and having a conversation about it. Then there are others that will use it as a testimony and be transparent enough to allow others to realize that they're not in this thing by themselves. Either way, if God forgives the inexcusable, his expectation of us is to do the same for someone else. Amen. It's so quiet. But I'm going to go to another scripture. Mark 11 and 25. Mark 11 and 25. And when you stand praying... All the prayer warriors. That may include all the deep folk, all the mysterious, the wonderful. When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. That means if you have unforgiveness in your heart, you run the risk of your prayers not even being heard. You're wasting time and breath. Just how many, I, I just wonder sometimes how many people that pray, that are really good at, you know, praying, especially um, publicly and out loud. Because not everyone is, is good at that. That doesn't, that doesn't make you bad or, or, or anything. It doesn't make you less than. But some of these public praying people, I wonder if they left some things unattended. If there was somebody they left feeling poorly or badly because they didn't forgive them for whatever offense, but they pray in anyhow. Can, can you just picture what it might be like? I know sometimes we, we give a, a metaphor of the uh, pr uh, praying and the, the prayer hit the ceiling and bouncing back. Uh, that, maybe that's a good one to, you know, it, it may not be going past the ceiling because of unforgiveness. You praying, but God's not listening. And I've already stated why. He went through some trouble to get his son here to forgive all of us. Why wouldn't he be disappointed in us if we couldn't find it within our hearts to forgive someone else? I know you're trying to figure out at what point do we not have to worry about that. Is, it, is, there a, is there a difference for the weight of the offense? It, if it was really, really, really bad, do I still have to really, really forgive? And the answer is yes. That's the expectation. One commentary says, according to this text, that Jesus was demonstrating that there is an unbreakable link between effective faith Filled prayer and forgiveness or the lack thereof. So you can't separate it. I don't care how good and spiritual you felt at the time of prayer. At some point, you got to get up off your knees and go tell somebody you're forgiven. You're forgiven. All right, let's go to the takeaways. Let's go to the takeaways. So we talked about why, how, and when. So let's, let's deal with why first. The first answer to the why question can be summed up in a statement, because God said so. All the scriptures that I just read, because God said so. He intended for us to be in right relationship with him. So he provided a way 
for that to happen. His only begotten son became that way by dying on a cross. We just got finished celebrating all of that. He became our sacrifice by shedding blood for our sins. He was buried and he got up from the grave. God did that so that we could be forgiven. And so, my question to you is, how can you receive such an undeserved gift and not be willing to offer that gift to others? Think about that for a second. How can you be so willing to receive it, but you struggle with giving it? And we make excuses for that. God knows my heart. He does. And that's why he prepared a way of escape. He does know your heart. He does know your heart. Your spiritual connection and relationship with God is at risk when you don't forgive. Let's be clear about that. Your spiritual connection and relationship with God is at risk when you don't forgive. Let's, let's move to the second reason for why. A second reason to forgive is freedom. Remaining connected to painful experiences or to people who have hurt you keeps you in bondage. Not them, you. I'm going to say that again. Remaining connected to a painful experience or experiences or people who have hurt you keeps you in bondage. Bishop Desmond Tutu says the only way to experience healing and peace is to forgive. Until we can forgive, we remain locked in our pain and locked out of the possibility of experiencing healing and freedom. Locked out of the possibility of being at peace. Now, I don't know about you all, but peace is very important to me. I will do whatever is necessary to have peace. Because when you don't have peace, and I heard enough amens to know that somebody knows what it is to not have peace. It's, it's a miserable place to be. No matter where you go, no matter what you try to do, that lack of peace goes with you. So if, if it's a matter of just, just letting somebody off the hook to have peace, if I'm going to be locked up in, 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 in pain and, and, and suffering and the lack of healing, because of unforgiveness? I don't think so. So while you thought that not forgiving that person for the pain that they caused you would in inflict pain on them, you are actually hurting yourself. You, you can be free. You can have peace. But you choose to be a prisoner to the pain. And you basically hand the key to the offender, to the person that caused you the pain in the first place. You, you went into prison and then handed the offender the key. You thought you were in control, but they're controlling you. So I want you to repeat this statement after me. Tonight, 
I begin the process of taking the keys back. I'm, I'm going to be in control. I'm going to control this. By not forgiving, you thought you were in control, but you gave control to the other person. Who, by the way, is off somewhere whistling while they work? Just happy-go-lucky. They're not bothered. They live in their life. And they may never, somebody say never. never, they may never acknowledge the fact that they caused you pain. And you just will have to accept that if you're going to forgive. You cannot make somebody apologize to you. And why lose good time? And for many years, so many have lost years, relationships with family members, because you determine that you are owed an apology. And you might be, but what if you never get it? How long are you willing to live in prison with that unforgiveness, that lack of peace, that lack of joy, because you're, you're determined, oh, I'm going to get an apology. If I ever speak to you again, it'll be because you apologized to me. Well, their attitude is, you don't have to never speak to me again. I'm going on to live my life. They didn't move across the country. They, they've, they've done, they've started a new life, and you still stuck because you think that somebody owes you an apology. Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? And, and, and speaking of being in control, I, I thought uh, my mind went straight to that last characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. If you're not in control, something or someone else is. So remember, forgiveness is not about the other person. Forgiveness is about you. Forgiveness is about you. It's about you getting free. It's about you letting go. It's about your peace. But remember, the first reason is to do it because God said so. Let's, let's start there. But secondly, freedom. The last uh, reason for why, why we forgive is because our health depends on it. Our physical health, our mental health depends on it. As, as the research concerning forgiveness evolves, the findings show that forgiving transforms people mentally. Now, this is science. This is scientific research, okay? It transforms people mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and even physically. So there's a um, article that was um, written by a, a doctor from John Hopkins Hospital. And let me just read what the, what the uh, article reveals. In that article, studies have found, and I quote, that the act of forgiveness can reap huge rewards for your health lowering the risk of heart attack, improving cholesterol levels and sleep, and reducing pain, blood pressure, levels of anxiety, depression, and stress. And research points to an increase in the forgiveness health connection as you age. So it's still being studied and, 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 and they're still looking at the weight of forgiveness or the lack of forgiveness as people get older. I just said, many have gone years still mad about something that happened in the family 40 years ago. 
40 years of holding on to something that you could have let go of and been free and probably healthier. The article goes on to say there is an enormous physical burden to being hurt and disappointed, says Dr. Karen Swartz, who is the director of the Mood Disorders Adult Consultation Clinic at John Hopkins Hospital. Chronic anger puts you into a fight or flight mode, which results in numerous changes in heart rate, blood pressure, and immune response. So if you sick all the time, you might need to think about if there's somebody you need to forgive. That doesn't have to be the reason, but I'm just thinking that you might want to consider that. Those changes then increase the risk of depression, heart disease, and diabetes, among other conditions. Forgiveness, however, calms stress levels, leading to improved health. Again, Bishop Desmond Tutu references scientific studies in his book entitled, The Book of Forgiving, The Book of Forgiving. He states, as more and more scientists document the healing power of forgiveness, they also look at the mentally and physically corrosive effects of not forgiving. Hanging on to anger and resentment Living in a constant state of stress can damage the heart as well as the soul. It's not worth it to me. And I do not stand here as if I've not had to forgive anybody. That is not the case. It was just too stressful to hold on to it. I don't like to feel stress. I don't like the feeling of my blood pressure increasing. I don't like the feeling of anxiety. And some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. So I've learned how to release people. I'm not talking about this cut your haters off language. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. That, that, to me, that's not true forgiveness. That's cutting your haters off. I'm talking about genuinely deciding I'm letting it go. Did I get an apology every time? Nope. But I didn't want to wait for that because that meant I would still be feeling some kind of way, especially every time I had to face the individual you know how it is when things ain't right with you and somebody that you used to have a relationship with and you see that you're getting ready to be in the same space that they're in and your heart start fluttering and you just start feeling some kind of way? No, I want to be able to walk in the same room as somebody that has mistreated me and speak and say, how you doing? You look good. Now, I ain't got to stand there and keep talking. Let's be clear. I don't have to continue the conversation, but I'm big enough to be able to walk in because I have forgiven. Now, if I hadn't forgiven, I would have to walk past like I didn't see or keep going. Now, it's been done to me, but that's their issue. That's not mine. So I can speak because I'm good. That's a wonderful place to be in. I didn't forget what you did. I just choose not to let it bother me any longer. That's the place we have to get to. That's the place we have to get to. So let's move to the how we can uh, do this. And I gotta move quickly because my time is gonna be up in just about 15 minutes. If we gonna have questions. I didn't say answers, I said we gonna have questions. <laughs> so, Another statement that Bishop Tutu made, and I'm, I mentioned the book, um, and it will be posted at the very last slide. Forgiveness is a choice. We make that choice. 
and the ability to forgive others comes from the recognition that we are all flawed and all human. Now, we like to make reference to our own mistakes when we mess up and somebody is trying to hold us accountable for what we did. I'm not perfect, but we seem to expect others to not be so flawed. But all of us are human and all of us are flawed. You can choose to forgive and experience the benefits of forgiveness, or you can choose not to forgive and experience the consequences. I'll say that again. You can choose to forgive and experience the benefits of forgiveness, or you can choose not to forgive and experience the consequences. So here's another thing to do. Um, that falls under the how. Change your perception. Change your perception. You can choose to hold on to the pain or, or to let it go. I keep, you keep hearing me make reference to choices and choosing because you can do that. If you have self-control, you can make choices, right? So you can choose to hold on to the pain or to let it go. You can choose to continue being a victim or you can choose freedom. Your perception is what's key. Your perception is what's key. How you see the circumstance. Sometimes we just need to have a different perspective. We need to see differently or we need to take a closer look so that we can see differently. Oftentimes, we don't take the time to take a closer look, to see what's actually happening. If, if there was a conflict, let's, let's take this look first. What was your role in the conflict? Ask, ask that question first. What was your role in the conflict? Ask yourself why you respond the way that you respond. Don't, don't make excuses. Don't try to rationalize. Don't go back to your trauma, although you may need to consider your trauma. What I'm saying is don't make excuses for your behavior. The, the point in asking the question is, is to take, to be considerate of what may have caused the conflict so that you can change the perspective of what's going on. You, you ask yourself, why you respond the way that you do, what traumatized you, because it may have a, a, an impact on why you behave the way you act. But you also have to consider the other person's behavior and why they do the things that they do. What might have traumatized them? Because you're not the only one that's been traumatized. So sometimes we need to stop and think why they may have done what they did. I'm not saying it's an excuse, but we're talking about changing our perspective. Not making excuses for the offense, but it helps to have an understanding. Okay? What could have been done differently? You may not have a clear answer, to any of these questions, but they should be taken into consideration when you're considering forgiveness. I'll just tell this quick story about a friend that I had many years ago. We worked together. Um, as a matter of fact, I would pick her up every day for work. Um, we had developed a really good relationship. Everything was good, so I thought, until one day she wasn't talking to me anymore, and I didn't understand why. And we actually went to the same church as well. And so I couldn't catch her at work to ask her. She wouldn't answer my phone calls. And literally, just like I described it, it happened. One day fine, next day not fine. So I caught her at church. And I said, hey, what's going on? Nothing, nothing, nothing. I said, well, I just wondered if I had done anything to offend you because you seem different. And no, everything's fine. Everything's okay. 
So I apologized just in case. I said, I'm, I'm really sorry if I did anything to, to hurt you, to offend you. Or, oh, it's good, and thank you for the apology. Now I want to know what am I apologizing for? <laughs> so I had to catch myself because I wasn't angry, but you're about to make me angry because you're, accept, you're accepting an apology, and I don't even know what I'm apologizing for. Many, many years went by. That was when I lived in Memphis, Tennessee, okay? And I'd lived in Cleveland, Ohio for 30 years, so that was a long time ago. I just want to say that this young lady never, I don't care how many times I went back to Memphis to visit, she literally would avoid speaking to me. I would deliberately get in her pathway to speak, and she would turn her head and walk the other way. I never till this day, found out what offended her and caused her to cut the relationship off. But I had to let it go because I would have driven myself crazy trying to understand. But this is what happened that was very interesting. A few years ago, she inboxed me on Facebook. And so, you know, I was surprised. I'm like, wow. Hey, and she just started talking and making fun, laughter, and all of that, like nothing ever happened. I said, okay, I'll go along with it. So I reached out to other friends in, in the area, and they said, did you know she has terminal cancer? I said, no, I did not. And they said, she's probably trying to make things right. I said, okay, well, I'm not going to bring it up. You know, I'm, I won't bring it up. Just before she did pass away, she said that it wasn't an I'm sorry apology. This is where you have to take what people can give, okay? It was, I know I don't have long to live, and I'm trying to make things right with everybody. That was her, I'm sorry. Now, what do I look like? trying to get more out of her than that. She was dying by this time. Over 30 years of a broken relationship, she's now in the grave, and I still have no idea what she was angry about. But I don't have cancer. I don't know if she got sick because she was holding on. I, I can't say that, but I can say that's what took her out of here. And I've not had a diagnosis of cancer. I was able to let it go. I had to forgive her for holding something against me. And so it works both ways. There was no point in me holding on to that. I just wanted to make that point because I don't know what, what triggered any of that in her. You know, some people wanted to say it's jealousy. Maybe so. I don't like that to be my first go-to. Jealous of what? We were together, we started the job together, we, was, we were friends, I don't know. You will not always be able to nail it down, and you have to be okay with that. All right, let me see now, I messed up my page, let me get myself together. All right, now, the next thing is change your expectation. Change your expectation of others. Too often we have an expectation of an individual that they don't have the capacity to fulfill. We expect too much from people. Another way to say it is you may be looking for something in a person that just isn't there. You're demanding an apology they don't have the capacity to even understand what they did wrong to start with. So they certainly can't say, I'm sorry, for something that they don't get. But you have to be okay with that. There are times you have to be okay with that. So while you're looking for them to feel remorse for what they've done, they don't. 
They don't feel what you feel. You may be expecting the other person to think or process information on the same level that you do. This, this expectation thing works on many levels for many subjects, not just forgiveness. But you, you, you may be expecting that person to think or process information on the same level you do, but they cannot. Some people just don't get it. And this is where you have to accept the reality that we are all, again, flawed and human. And there is certainly something that falls short in all of us. All of us. So lower your expectation. Stop looking for people to give what they just don't have. They just don't have it. So who's going to be the bigger person? You have to ask yourself those questions. Next, embrace the process. Embrace the process. Forgiveness is a process. Not only is forgiveness a choice, but it is a process. Even if it is something we believe we should do, and we know why we should do it, it does not happen immediately. Why? Because we are human. Jesus went through a process to get to the cross. He went through a process. He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In other words, let your will be done. He prayed this same prayer three times because he knew he was about to be arrested and that would be the beginning of his suffering. But it was the process necessary for our forgiveness. That was the beginning. He was arrested. He was beaten. You know the story. We, just, we heard it of the, over the last few weeks over and over again. Spit on, uh, slapped, all kinds of things. That was his process to get forgiveness for us, just so we could be forgiveness, for, forgiven. Forgiveness is a matter of the heart. So you may have to ask yourself if you have the capacity to forgive. You may need to ask yourself that question. You probably don't have the capacity to do it on your own especially if the offense rises to the level of physical harm or violence or betrayal, and that's okay. And that leads me to the when do we forgive, and I'm coming to the end of this presentation. When we talk about it being a process, forgiveness being a process, the when does not necessarily rely on immediacy as much as it relies on a willingness to be open to forgiveness. As Christians, we should have a ready yes. A ready yes. We should be ready uh, to, to uh, and, and, and be willing and, um, to say yes to the concept of forgiveness. We should be at a ready, get set, go position that leads to forgiveness. If not, you will end up spending time, too much time, replaying the offense over and over again. You'll continue to rehearse the pain that has been inflicted. So 
you may not be able to forgive immediately, right on the spot, but you should be in a, pos a position or a, 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 of readiness and willing to start the process, especially as Christians. Our Savior went through too much for us to be in this room tonight and claim forgiveness of sin. No, we're not Jesus. I'm not God, but we're supposed to be striving to be like him. You will begin attempting to cover the deep wounds with a Band-Aid while still bleeding all over the place. The longer you take to initiate the process, the longer it will take to arrive at the place of healing. So quickly, let's talk about what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not simple. Forgiveness is not easy. Because, like Paul in Romans 7, the good that I would do, I don't do, because evil is always right in front of me. So, it's not easy. And it's not my intention to make you believe that it is easy. But we start out with, with the whole um, thing that it must be done because God said so. Forgiveness is not weakness. It is not weakness. It is just the opposite. It takes an unwavering strength to both extend and to ask for forgiveness. It is a strength rooted in Christ who hung from a cross and proclaimed from the cross but to those who were doing the damage, those who were killing him, Father, forgive them. Now that's powerful. I'm, I'm looking at you murder me. And with my last breath, Father, forgive them. It was so powerful that it was powerful enough to save all of us. And he did it 2,000 years ago. And so that same salvation is available for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and our great-great-grandchildren all the way into the future until he comes back. That's how powerful his forgiveness is. Do you know how powerful forgiving somebody that does not deserve to be forgiven? I'm talking about by you. How powerful that is. Sometimes people can't even handle it. They'd rather for you to stay angry with them. That's what they're used to. But when you genuinely forgive somebody and you can be kind to them, some people don't know how to handle that. So while uh, it, it, it not, it's not easy to forgive, it may seem easier or, or seem um, uh, to give a, a sense of control, the reality is it takes real strength and courage to actually forgive someone who has harmed you. It takes work. It may include counseling, therapy, prayer, fasting, whatever you got to do to get to it, but you should be working toward it. Many people mistake forgiveness with repressing emotions and think they have to stop being angry when they're hurt. But forgiveness is not about running away from your feelings or being in denial about your feelings. P please understand, I want to be clear about that. None of what I've said tonight is about being in denial. Forgiveness is not about looking uh, deep and extra spiritual. 
like you're, you're not affected by the painful things people say and do to you. That's not real forgiveness. That's a look. That's an act. Forgiveness does not equal amnesia. I know people like to say forgive and forget. The forgiveness will come long before forgetting comes, unless I just lose my mind. That's what makes it so powerful. It does not mean forgetting. That is one of the reasons it is so powerful. I remember everything that was said and done. I remember the harm that was inflicted on me. I am hurt. I have been treated unfairly. I am ashamed. I am angry. I am sad. All of those things at the same time. And yet, I can release you. I will not attempt to hold the person or persons who harmed me hostage, hoping they will pay for my pain. Not going to do it. Forgiveness is not quick. We've already established that it is a process. And your process will not look like my process. But there will be a process. Remembering is part of the process. Grieving is part of the process. Naming the feelings and emotions is part of the process. And there may be several journeys through these cycles before arriving at freedom. But that is the goal. Somebody shout freedom. freedom. My time, what time is it? My time out yet? Okay, give me, I got a few minutes, very few, very few. So after you understand why you must forgive, how to forgive, and when to start the process of forgiveness, I challenge you to demystify your understanding of God's grace. This may be the first thing you have to do. When we mystify his grace, or we are confused about his grace, it is difficult to live in his grace. And when we don't live in his grace, it is difficult for us to extend grace to others. So you must see yourself in the place the psalmist describes in Psalm 103, 2 through 3. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases. God's unconditional love for us is the motivation behind his unmerited forgiveness of our sins. We did not have to work for it. So I close again with the question that I asked earlier, and then I'll stop and give you an opportunity to ask your questions. How can you receive such an undeserved gift and not be willing to offer that gift to others? Well, we could do better than that. Let's give her a hand of applause. <laughs> Ellen, I have a few questions. The first one is, can you forgive and still pray for justice and vindication, especially when you are still struggling with the hurt and damage the offender has caused? Can you still forgive it's saying, I'll, I'll read it again. Can you forgive and still pray for justice and vindication? That's the part. That, that's right there. Yes. Okay. I don't think we have to separate forgiveness from justice. 
And I was going to share a story, but it might not, I, I want to get to the questions. But I do have a story of another friend who had to wait on justice for her 14-year-old daughter who was raped and murdered. And she forgave him. But I'll come back to that after a few more questions. But so, justice is, is necessary. Has nothing to do with your heart of forgiving the person or the individual, the perpetrator, the offender, the whoever. Justice is justice. We have to live according to the laws of the land. Okay, the next question. I'm a forgiving person, but how do I deal with someone doing evil work around me? Not sure what evil work around me is, but if you're a forgiving person, you have to continue to forgive that individual. Now, you may need to separate yourself. You may need to change your space. Um, it doesn't make sense to stay in a, in a position that is harmful, especially with an individual that's going to keep harming you. So you may have to change your space, relocate, do something different. But um, if you are indeed a forgiving person, then you, you will just keep forgiving. But it doesn't mean that you have to keep accepting abuse. That's good. I have so many questions. Um, it is difficult to offend, I'm sorry, it is difficult to forgive when the offenders rev in their actions and does it make it seem like their your issues matter? Repeat the question, I'm sorry. Okay. Let me go down again, sorry. I'm sorry. It is difficult to forgive when the offenders rev in their actions and does it make it seem like your issues matter, how should I forgive? Um, I pretty much answered the how. There, I know there are some things, horrendous things that people have done. But again, forgiveness is a choice. And sometimes, you have that choice includes again separating yourself putting yourself in a position that's um, a position of safety um, uh, whatever whatever you need to do again the, the the forgiveness is not about the other person necessarily the forgiveness is about you the individual who has to extend the forgiveness that you're giving the grace that is not earned, deserved, or any of that. It's a choice. It's a choice. But can I say this again? I, I said it, and I'm going to say it again, because I know that there are always those individuals who sit in a room, because it's going to always be about one out of four or five, that have suffered abuse. And you're struggling with forgiving the abuser. I know that's a lot of work. That's a lot of hard work. But if you can at least get yourself to the place where you want to start the process of forgiveness, then you're, that's a good start. But you can forgive the abuser. You can. It seems impossible. But with the same love and forgiveness that was gifted to you, you can provide that same gift to somebody else. Last question for online. How do you forgive when the person keeps doing the same thing that warrants forgiveness? How do you? How do you forgive? <laughs> it's the, the how-to is, is what the constant theme here. Um, clearly, the individual has issues that you cannot fix, which takes it back to you as the one who forgives or, or offers the forgiveness. It's about you. It's about you. And I have to ask the question, 
How many times will you put yourself in the same place for the person to continue to do the same thing over and over again? Yeah, it's okay to remove yourself from a situation that's not healthy. Um, so the how is, is really, again, changing your perspective. It could be about changing your perspective about the other person or the, your perspective about yourself. What do you think about yourself that would allow you to stay in a position where you're constantly mistreated or abused or mishandled? Now, do we have any questions in the house? Oh, boy. Oh. Now, we're going to wrap, so. Why does it seem that forgiving yourself is so much harder than forgiving others? That's good. Um, there is so much about forgiveness that we had a limited amount of time, to, but that is key. Forgiving yourself is key, and it is very necessary. Sef situations vary. Um, since I brought up uh, abuse, uh, and, but I brought it up because I know it's on somebody's mind, and that's not prophetic, that's just, it just life. Um, oftentimes, people, those who, people who have been abused will blame themselves for the, the abuse. What did I do wrong? What could I have done differently? It was my fault. No. There's nothing you did to deserve being abused. So that would be an in instance where you would need to forgive yourself and let that go. But you, you have to forgive yourself because we've also been commanded to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And we, have, we can't love our neighbors the right way until we love ourselves. Hey, um, good evening, everybody. I just wanted to real quick, because I was in the class last week about communication and it's connected to forgiveness, right? And somebody posed a question about forgiving their parent. Fast forward really quickly, I had a like real tumultuous relationship with my mom. So for 20 years, I was kept throwing the olive branch out, kept throwing it out and she would never respond. Sent the email Friday, got an email back Monday from her. For the first time in 43 years of my life, she actually apologized for what she did. And what God told me in that moment was to leave the door open because you tapped into something when you said, accept what people are willing to give you because that's all she knew how to do in that moment. And so I just wanna say, if you're gonna forgive, forgive without expectation. That's it. Amazing, amazing. And can I say, not everybody is clueless. People know when they, th there may be a few people that are clueless, but not everybody. Most people know exactly what they did. Um, good evening. My question is, um, does forgiveness require reconciliation? Does it require reconciliation, like you can forgive a good person, question. but do I need to still have that relationship or be open to the relationship? Uh, good question. Again, I tried not to go off on too many tangents. Um, it does not. <laughs> and let's stick with the abuse situation. You know what, I'll just tell a part of that story. What my friend that whose uh, daughter was raped and murdered and she forgave the person the first thing when I was talking to her yesterday about this, the first thing she said, and I'm not inviting him over to dinner. He ain't coming to my house for dinner. But I had to forgive him because unforgiveness was like a cancer in me. And even when she got angry about walking out inside in the sunlight and realizing that the same sun that was shining on her was shining on this guy, and you know, God really, why? but she got to such a place of forgiveness. But we talked about that. And even um, um, Bishop Tutu's book includes some of that uh, discussion. It does not always equal reconciliation. Now God did that for us to be reconciled back to him. But forgiveness does open the pathway that can lead to reconciliation, but it's not always the, the thing to do. 
All right, so the question I'm going to ask is, up until Jesus was 33, was there any uh, records that, that state that Jesus didn't forgive immediately, such as it might have took days, weeks, months, or years? Okay, so the all right. Is there any record that, that um, Jesus didn't forgive immediately, such as it might have took days, weeks, months, or years in his life before he went to the cross? We don't have any record of Jesus not forgiving anybody. Um, his greatest act on earth was going to the cross to forgive everyone. That's why he came. He was only on earth for three, uh, well, no, 33 years, but his ministry was for three years. We have nothing that to suggests that he struggled with forgiving anybody. Keep in mind, he was all human, but he was all God as well. Well, we can't replicate that process, but we are to take what he did as a guide for us to live by. We, we, you, you, you want to die on the cross? No, no. None of us are going to die. We don't, they don't even do that, especially not in America. I don't know anywhere that that's still what happens for people's punishment. That was the way to, to punish people at that time. Christ wasn't the only one that died on the cross, but we don't have to do that again. That's already been done. So we don't, that, there's no replication of that. Well, you know, it's, it's constantly being said, you should do what the Jesus did. Yeah, but it doesn't mean replication. But that's the thing, he was going to the cross. He was forgiving us right away. Forgive, you know, that's the key, forgive. If you replicate that, you'll be well on your way. Right. Just forgiveness. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's Im imitate to be like, it's a guide. It doesn't mean that none of us can go through what he went through. We could never go through what he went through. But again, all God and all man. Are there any other questions? Well, let's. Yes, if you'll come up. Hello to everyone. Uh, my question is: Is if you sincerely forgive someone in your heart, but you never see them again to make it right? No, you have forgiven them, but you haven't seen them or to, to show that I forgive you, I hope you forgive me. Um, you know, so can you still be, you know, in forgiveness without actually ever seeing that person again? So like say hadn't your friend contacted you and she had just passed, but you knew in your heart you had forgiven her though you didn't understand what it was all about. So say had she never reached out to you, but you had forgiven her in your heart, is that still considered forgiveness? Well, I had forgiven her before she ever reached out to me. Right. Because I realized at a point, again, when I said I had a higher level I'm sorry. I realized I had a higher uh, level of expectation than I should have had of her. I don't know the situation, what your situation is like, and it's not necessary for me to know. You have to determine whether or not there should be some work toward reconciliation, if that's what you're talking about. Um, you have to decide whether it's necessary for the person to, feel, to know that you have forgiven them. You have to be careful with that because if they don't feel like there was anything to be forgiven for, then that's going to be an offense. So you have, you know, what is the, you have to um, think about what the reasons would be to reach out to the person to make them aware. If you have genuinely forgiven them in your heart, that is what, that is, what is required, period. That's what's required. So reconciliation, a conversation, 
you have to figure out if that would be the right thing to do. I can't tell you that because I don't know the relationship. I don't know the issue. I don't know the situation. And even if I did, it, what I would do may not be the right thing for you to do. At the end of the day, if you have genuinely forgiven that person, then maybe then you, that might be the end of it. But if you feel like there's something more, there's unfinished work or whatever, you have to decide whether or not you will approach that person with that. But I would tread lightly. Thank you. Thank you. Hey Amen. Let's give Dr. Ellis a hand. Come on, we could do better than that. Let's give her a hand of applause. She has walked us through on how to forgive. Dr. Ellis, if you would close us out in prayer. Oh, sure. <laughs> I'm sure that um, there were those of you that had questions that didn't get to ask them. Forgiveness is not an easy thing. Um, and it is a struggle for many Christians, but it is absolutely necessary. It is absolutely required. And I just pray that something was said tonight that will at least start you on the journey toward forgiveness. If all of us could tell our stories, we could be here till tomorrow the same time. It is only the grace of God that many of us have our right minds based on some of the things that have been done to us, said to us. It's only God's grace. And so my prayer for each of you tonight is that even if it was the slightest, the little, the smallest thing that you needed to forgive all the way to the greatest, that the process begins tonight. Tonight, you take the keys back. You take the keys back to your peace, your good health, your emotional health, your physical health, all of that. Our Father and our God, we thank you for being God, first of all and most of all. We thank you for the example that you set for all of us. We thank you for sending your Son to ensure that our sins would be forgiven. He was our sacrifice. So we don't have to slay a lamb anymore and we don't have to sprinkle blood on the door. You've given us a lamb, and we thank you for that. The greatest example of forgiveness. Now help us, show us, teach us. Help us to open our hearts for the possibilities of forgiving. Show us how to forgive the greatest offenses Teach us, heal our hearts, and give us peace. Help us to give you a yes, because the greatest thing for us is to live a life that's pleasing to you. We want to please you, and so we say yes tonight to the process. We can't do it without you. So we ask that you continue to walk with us on this journey as we begin to release others and show them that they too can be reconciled back to you. And we thank you for all of this. We thank you for everything that's been said. We thank you for every thought, every idea. Thank you for allowing me the privilege to speak into the lives of these people. Now don't allow anyone to leave this place the way that they came. In Jesus' name, amen.